Thank you all for, for being here. And I, I will be uh, very brief. We only have 10 minutes. So let me just show you some pictures, which I think the pictures could help to understand the problem and why it's so important, given that the conference is on resilience. So let me first try to look at what is happening in the global governance. I am going to look at the global level. I am not going to look at the country and regional levels. The other speakers will focus on that. Uh, and I will just bring some of the concepts that we have been looking at and some of the issues that we think uh, are important to be look at the global level. Now, what is the first picture? So the first picture is, is that I would like to avoid that little car to fall uh, and to have enough roads to avoid the car to fall. That's my first problem. So if I have a, a choke in prices, I will try to avoid that shock. I will try to avoid excessive volatility. But that's the first thing. The second thing is I will try to have elements that will allow me to recover that car after it has fallen if the scenario was not resilient enough that would allow me to protect and have a good insurance system or a mechanism to protect that. But what we observe is that that not necessarily is the case. And instead of being able to save that little car, what happens is that everything falls. <laughs> and the situation gets a little bit worse. So I have to resolve that. Okay. And the problem is that once I start to get panic, uh, I get even more panic and bring more help. <laughs> but that continues to happen. <laughs> so then we're in a global problem. Uh, and we're in a situation where I need to bring a hole. <laughs> and I won't fall it again. So, but, but we can, when I arrive to that situation, in this, uh, in this environment of prices, I could really have already have affected an enormous amount of people. So we need to avoid that. And that's for me resilience, the two elements. And what we observe is that we fail, okay, in both, in the case of prices and, and, and food security. This is a clear example of this track falling. The yellow bar here shows what the choke in the 207, 208, because of the droughts or natural uh, droughts are happening that time in Australia, sorry, Kim, and in other countries, uh, what was the effect of the chops, which was around 10% of, of increasing prices. But then the other bars, the brown, the green, and the, and the light blue, show the other effects that were created because of the policies imposed by the countries. Export bans, export restrictions, and so on and so forth, especially in countries that were export, uh, import, important exporters of the commodities. And then you have, of course, the interaction effect. So look how the effect, the initial effect of the choke was exacerbated because of wrong policies in that moment in time uh, that were not appropriate and didn't resolve the problem. Instead of resolving it, it exacerbated the problem. And there is work by Kim and, Will, and uh, Will Martin showing that for the case of rice, for example, how complex was the consequence of those and the effects of those and how we complicate things even more. So that's what I, what I was trying to, to tell you so that we can try to find ways in which we avoid this thing in the future and we can improve the resilience in both elements, also in the policy response, which is very important at the global level. The second example of this graph is to show the import tariffs on food products, which is a heavy burden for the poor across the different countries. So you have a variety of countries. You have the average uh, tariff in yellow uh, uh, on calories and the average tariff in proteins. Look at that variance and the different levels we have according to the countries. Something is wrong there. It doesn't make too much sense. And we are affecting consumption of calories and consumption of proteins. So if we have a choke in a, in a big producer country with that structure of tariffs, it will be very difficult for that country to be resilient to that choke and to be able to avoid those potential, potential problems. Now, what do we have today? And where are we today? Because I think it's important. What I show in this graph is a very complex thing behind, but very simple graphically. Basically, each bar represents the numbers of days. The blue bar is maize, the, yellow, the red bar is soybean, the yellow is soft wheat, and the green is hard wheat for future prices at the global level through Chicago Exchange. And what the numbers of days represent is the number of days in which we fall in periods of excessive volatility. And please underscore excessive because the definition of excessive here is a statistical standard definition that allows us to count across time these elements of excessive volatility, which basically it means that the, the changes in prices were so high that there was only a 5% probability of them happening. Like the probability of me going down the street and being crushed by a car. Okay, So it's very low the probability, that's why we call it excessive. Why we focus on excessive? Because that's where volatility could matter both for the producers, because they don't know what to do, and could matter for the consumers. Because now we know through evidence that we have already analyzed that excessive volatility also affects consumers 
through the global price indexes of the countries. And we have done that for several countries by now. So it's not only producers, it's also consumers. Which in the case of price levels, we always knew, and it's easy to understand why it will affect consumers. Now, what you can see there is that basically in the period of 2007, 2008, which are uh, the bars in the middle, we have significant numbers of days, more than 100 days of excessive volatility, which were as a result of the chocks, the natural chocks, but also the exacerbation because of the policies. So both were the ones behind what was happening then. And then later on have reduced, but today, in 2012, 13, and today, we still don't have periods of excessive volatility. So when people are still saying that we are in excessive volatility today, up to now, it's not the case. Soybeans is getting closer lately, but up to now, we don't have that level that we had before. That doesn't mean that we solve the problem. Not at all, we are very far from it. So the car will still fall, and the trucks will still fall, and I will explain you why. But that's the situation today so that you have an idea and be able to question when people say, oh, we are still in high volatility. Now, that's not the global level. At the country level, it could be a different story. Okay? So it's important to have a common definition to be able over that to analyze what we could do. So this is just a sum of, of the cases. So what is the situation also in terms of stocks? Today, we look at the commodities. Basically, when the little triangle goes up, means that we are doing good previous to the month uh, forecast. And from the previous season, apparently most of the commodities were doing good, so we have a good harvest. And in only in the soybeans case, we have some tightening. Now, but what is the global structure that puts in question this capacity to be resilient? The first thing is what the King was saying, and what, was, uh, what Brian Wright was saying uh, from Berkeley, is the issue of a stock to use ratio. The red circle is showing the points where we have very low levels of a stock to use ratio. And basically what this is saying, is when the level of stocks at the global level are so low, there is a high probability that we will have a, a price spike. Because I don't have capacity at the global level to supply what I need. But I was not the only element. The other element which is important is how concentrated is the structure of the exports in the world market. So these graphs just show the share of the top five exporters in the world by commodity. So in the case of maize, 84% of five countries concentrate 84% of the exports. In wheat, 63%. In rice, 95%, and in, in the two different types of rice, and in the other type of rice, the broken rice, 80%. Now, why is this so important? Because if I am having climatic shocks around the world, and any of these countries is affected, that automatically will create a problem in the exports at a global level. Because they are so important in that commodity, that will create me an effect. So any climatic increase in climatic variance put me at higher risk. And that's what I need to change. That has been improved lately. Brazil, for example, in the last year has become an important exporter and a bigger increase in their share. And there is also improvement in other regions. But still, the structure we face today is extremely risky and could create vulnerability that we need to look at it carefully. And this is the other case, which is the increase in the number of extreme events, which has been increasing and we expect to be increasing. So to answer the questions of Kim, yes, we think we are a different trend in terms of, of levels of prices. Second, we were in periods of excessive volatility and serious periods of excessive volatility, which were exacerbated by the problems of export bans, export barriers. But the problem is that the structure, we have a very concentrated market, and still we don't have the global level of stocks that we used to have before, which make us more vulnerable. And it is linked, this is linked with a potential increase in variability and in climatic shocks, which will could have serious, uh, serious events. Now, the question now is, in my last two minutes, is what to do? And how at the global level we can improve this? And there are issues that we need to separate what we can do at the short term and what we can do at the long term. So in the short term, if I have an economy or a country that has developed mechanisms like exchanges, futures markets, it's very easy or simpler to handle and to cope with those risks. I can use ways of coverage for the different farmers, and even I can put some little subsidies in the short term to protect, for example, small farmers. But for that, to be able to use these hedging mechanisms, I need an institutional infrastructure to be set in place. If I don't have in the short term that institutional infrastructure, it's a lot more difficult. And first, I will need to develop it. And that's what countries need to do to start to invest to be able to have those coping strategies. But as to be able to protect farmers from changes and volatility, because basically it could increase and, imp and make more difficult their decision making in planting. Now, another issue, another thing that was very common in the global level is the issue of reserves. But what we need to be careful on reserves, and there is more that will be talked about it is that when we talk of reserves, at the country level, there is evidence 
that the country's lack of institutional capacity to be able to target properly, to trigger them, to identify their size, and to have a clear objective trigger when to execute them. And to be thinking of being able to stabilize prices is close to an Im Im impossible idea. We cannot predict prices daily. Okay? We can predict volatility, we can predict changes, but to predict levels of prices is close to impossible. We all of us won't be here, we'll be making a lot of money. So we need to be very careful in having that design. But what will make a little bit more sense is to have a mechanism where we share the risk at the regional level. Okay? In which sense, I don't have to predict prices in one country, but I can have a diversification strategy at the regional level for humanitarian purposes, for example, where I can use a good trigger and a good rule of allocation of those reserves that allows me to protect and create some resilience for humanitarian purposes. And that's a little bit what ECOWAS is trying to do after the G20 of, of Paris, and what some regions like the Asian Plus Three has been trying to do. Parallel to that, we need to have mechanisms in the short term to be able to resolve the problem of the most vulnerable, and those are the transfers, conditional or unconditional. There was a lot talked that on that, but that's something that we need to have in place and learn at the global level of the practices. Now, at the medium and long term, the goal, basically, is how we can create policies that will allow countries uh, to be less vulnerable. And that, those are related to infrastructure, those are related to investment in research and development, those are related in improvements of productivity, and the different trade policies that will allow me to avoid those type of problems so that the goods will flow and we, I will have better quality of goods. But we need to be careful that we comply with the WTO, WTO rules but the important thing here is that we know and we have evidence that the more the openness of the trade, the better the flow of the goods and the less the probability that I will face shortages over time. But for sure, openness also have distributional effects. Within the country, some will be winners, some will be losers. And as our own strategy at the country level and at the regional level, we need to think carefully about those so that we avoid any problem with them. Thank you so much.